Mark chapter number one this morning. And I'm grateful to continue our series through the gospel of Mark. But before we do, I do wanna speak to the dads just for a moment. I wanna encourage them with a couple of things. Uh, First of all, uh, guys and men uh, here today that are fathers, uh, I wanna remind you that though we are in a society where dads are often overlooked, God sees you. I want you to know that today. God sees you, God sees the effort, God sees your heart. And he sees the fact that you love your families and you love your children and you are doing your best to pursue the Lord. And church family, I would encourage you, uh, encourage, uh, encourage you to encourage uh, the dads here in our church today. We need to be praying for our fathers. We need to be praying for those in our church family and supporting them to keep living for the Lord, to keep doing the hard work of being faithful to their spouses and faithful to their children and faithful to the Lord. You know, as a father of four boys, I understand how, how often there are many barriers in our world. There's uh, not only the cultural barriers, but there's just my own heart. There's a sinful heart and desire sometimes to not uh, be uh, faithful and not fulfill the call that God has given me. And yet we need to do that. And so I'm challenging you guys this morning to do that. Be faithful. Remember that you're raising a generation uh, to love and serve others as Christ has loved and served you. And so if you are a dad today, I wanna remind you that God has given you an incredible privilege. It is an incredible privilege to bring into this world and to raise for the Lord eternal beings. And so I challenge you to do not delay, do not delay dads in honoring the Lord to raise your family and your children uh, for him. If there's something in your life, I'm just gonna, the rest of you just pretend like, uh, like you're not, don't listen, okay? The rest of you don't listen, all right? I'm gonna talk to you dads just for a moment, okay? If you're a dad here today, and if there's something in your life that you need to get together, you know what I mean when I say that? Uh, I'm not saying this in a hard way. Okay, please understand my heart in this. Get it together. (laughs) Your family needs you. Your family needs you. Your children need you, okay? They need you. Those of you that have children that are grown and out of the house, they still need you. They need you to be that example. They need you to be that faithful person that they can turn to for advice. I'm so blessed. Uh, to have a dad that I can turn to even, even these days. I call him and say, hey, what do I do? I need help. I need advice. And so be that person. And so guys, be that strong man that God's called you to be. Be that father. And I, I know that maybe you didn't have the greatest example of, of a father. I know there's many of you that maybe your dad left you. Maybe your dad passed away when you were young. You can always turn to your heavenly father, of course, but there's a lot of great examples here, even in this church that you can go to for advice and for help. And so let's, let's be strong, all right? Let's be the men that God wants us to be and let's raise our families and let's uh, keep on uh, serving them as we can. I heard this once a long time ago. Um, your children will not remember, uh, their children will, will not remember the money that you spend on them, but they'll remember the time you spend with them. And that's something that's been so helpful to me because sometimes as dads, we're tempted to think, well, hey, I'm providing for you and I'm, I'm working hard and I'm providing for you. Listen, your kids, they need you more than anything else. They need you. And so keep that in mind as we head into this Father's Day. You say, great, I came here to get beat up today. No, this is just an encouragement, all right? I just want to encourage you. uh, And the rest of the message isn't going to be about dads, okay? So I I needed to get a couple of things in there as we get started today. Uh, We are stewards, fathers. We are stewards of the gifts of God. And we need to remember that, that God has honored us with that. And so let's uh, take that authority and that leadership that God has given us and let's be obedient and submissive to him as we raise them for the Lord. Okay, we're getting back in the Gospel of Mark. Sound good? We got that. And we're back in the Gospel of Mark today. And I want to give you just a quick reminder as we started last week, this brand new study together. And the reminder is, of course, that this is a book written by a man by the name of John Mark. And he is writing down uh, more than likely what we understand. He is writing down the recollections of the apostle Peter as they had a very close relationship and Peter was telling him about uh, the life of Christ and his ministry with Jesus and John Mark was writing these down and recording them for us. Uh, The Gospel of Mark is a very unique book. It's unique because it is the shortest of the Gospels and it is believed to be the oldest of the Gospels. In fact, both Matthew and Luke reference some 95% of the Gospel of Mark in their writings. One of the other things that is unique about Mark that you'll notice is that it's not in chronological order. Uh, It actually kind of jumps around a little bit and you'll hear me throughout the series reference other Gospels or other things that happen in between. But if you'll remember, Mark is writing to a primarily Roman audience. And so he uses kind of quick language and the focus of the book is primarily on the actions of Jesus more than the words of Jesus. 
And that is something that distinguishes it among the other gospels because they often would reflect and spend great passages on what Jesus was saying. The gospel of Mark is very much about what Jesus is doing. And of course, in Mark chapter 10, in verse number 45, we get the theme for the series, which is that Jesus came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And that's where we get the idea that Jesus came as a servant. He came to serve. And that's the picture that Mark is giving to us here, that he is a servant. Now remember, he is writing to Romans. And so to the Romans, identifying a king, a servant king as a, as a servant would have been something that was very foreign to them. Remember to the Romans that much of their society, uh, I, I believe it was something like 80% of the Roman society was in what we call indentured servitude. And, uh, and so they were very used to the idea of servants, but to them, a servant was somebody who took orders. It was somebody who received uh, direction and instruction, and then they went and did the instruction. What they were not ready for was the fact that Jesus, yes, was a servant, but he was a servant with authority. He was a servant with power. He came to serve us, even though he was so much further above us. And that's what is so unique about Jesus is that though he had the power of almighty God, he humbled himself for you and for me so that he could serve us. And that's the unique picture that we see here in the gospel of Mark is that Jesus is the servant, yet he has all authority and power. And that's really the topic of this morning's message is the idea of the authority of the servant being revealed in the ministry and the life of Jesus Christ. Now, if you remember back with me to last week, now I know that's maybe a long ways back. And for some of you, how many, oh, that was actually kind of disturbing. How many of you were like, yes, that's a long time ago, uh, last Sunday. <laughs> Okay, so last Sunday when we started it, uh, we talked about in the very last section of the, of the uh, verses that we read, we, we saw the baptism of Jesus by John. You remember that? And as Jesus, as he was down in the water and was baptized of John the Baptist, uh, not because he needed to, a baptism of repentance, but because he was uh, identifying himself with John and with his teaching, as he came up out of the water, we saw something incredible happen. We saw the Holy Spirit descend as a dove. That doesn't mean it was a dove, okay? And uh, we have some dove-like creatures around Vancouver and there's nothing really special about them, right? But it came down as a dove. It appeared in that form and it, it came down upon him and we heard the voice of the father speak. And what did he say about his son? He said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And so we see the affirmation of Jesus through the Spirit and through the Father. And here we have this great picture of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in one place. And it's the inauguration of his ministry there. There in the Jordan River, as John brought him up, and we see this incredible affirmation happen, it was the beginning of Christ's ministry. But as we come into our passage this morning, and I'll begin reading for you here in a moment in verse number 12, what happens next is not something that you and I would expect. The king had been announced. The messenger was there and he had been proclaiming that the king was coming. And so you would have expected some great reception, uh, some great celebration, some thousands of people, you know, coming there to uh, be introduced to the Messiah. But rather what we see is that God takes him from that peaceful environment alongside the Jordan River. And as we read here in verse 12, he takes him immediately to the wilderness. In verse number 12, it says, and immediately. Now I'm gonna highlight that word because you're gonna see that all throughout the gospel of Mark. Words like immediately, suddenly, quickly. You're gonna see this happen. And so immediately after this baptism, it says that the spirit drove him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan and was with the wild beasts and the angels ministered unto him. Without a moment to even catch his breath, Jesus is immediately driven, notice by the same Holy Spirit that had just come down upon him, by the same spirit, dry, the idea is drives or thrusts him into the wilderness, not to take a vacation and 40 days off before he starts his ministry, but to be tempted for 40 days by Satan himself. Now to you and I, when we read this, we think, well, that's kind of unfair, isn't it? Wouldn't you think, like, God, why would you do that to him? I mean, you just declared him for who he is. Why is it that you would then send him out into the wilderness to be tempted of Satan? The language that Mark uses here, I want you to understand, does not indicate that this was an unfortunate event. Like, oh man, poor Jesus, he had to go to the wilderness. That's not the idea here. 
The idea is that uh, it was Mark's way of showing to us and the way that he used the language that this was something with a purpose. Like there was a purpose behind this. God was doing something. He was preparing him before he began to fulfill his ministry and his purpose. And before he ever could do that, and before God could ever, uh, 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 his ministry begin to go out and to be done here, what we notice is that he needed to face the enemy of God. He needed to face Satan for a purpose. And that purpose was to reveal his authority over him. And so if you're taking notes there in your note sheet, I want you to first of all notice here, authority over the enemy. We see Jesus, the servant, and his authority was over the enemy. We look again at verse 12 through 13. The spirit drove him to the wilderness and he was there, tempted of Satan and was with the wild beasts and the angels ministered unto him. Now, I find it so interesting. If you have been in church at all in your life, you would recognize this story and you would know that there's a lot of details about this story. But Mark doesn't give us any of those details. You notice that? He gives us two verses and he's like, by the way, he went to the wilderness, was tempted to Satan. All right, let's move on. (laughs) Now there's so much more to this story, of course. And Matthew, Matthew chapter four, and also in the gospel of Luke gives us a lot of details that fills in some of the gaps, but not all of the gaps of those 40 days. We are told that Jesus was fasting during that time in the wilderness. More than likely, it was in a region uh, on the, on the uh, west side of the Dead Sea called Jeshimon. And it was a very desolate wasteland. It was a place where there were a lot of, as described here, wild beasts in this region right here. And it's believed that's where Jesus went during this time and then was, of course, tempted by Satan. It was a difficult place. Of course, the environment was very difficult. But more than that was the fact that Satan was there tempting him. Now, the the passages that we have here in Matthew and Luke tell us about three different instances that Jesus uh, dealt specifically with the devil. But the understanding here in the passage is that this was actually a constant, never-ending process of temptation for 40 days. We come into the story later on in in the other gospels near the end of it, But there was a whole bunch of time before then where Jesus was under constant temptation by the devil. He was tempted with the lust of the flesh. He was tempted with the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. These are the three basic categories given to us in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 16 that really all temptations fall under those categories. I believe in your notes, you can write them down, but I just wanted to just quickly emphasize them. The lust of the flesh in scripture is anything to do with our physical desires. The lust of the eyes is our desire for the things, the material, the prestige, the power of this world that we would be lifted up in the eyes of ourselves and in the eyes of others. And then of course, there is the pride of life, which is pride in what I've accomplished, uh, making it about myself, it's about me. And so each of the recorded temptations of Jesus that we have, it, they fall in those categories. But beyond that, understanding that this was a continual temptation, it was much more than just those three examples given to us. That is why we understand Hebrews chapter four and verse 15 that tells us we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Understand that Jesus was tempted in every way, just like us. He was tempted in the same way that you are tempted. Now, there was a big distinction, isn't there? What's the distinction? Yet without sin. That's a big deal right there. That is a reminder for us that he is the sinless savior, that he is the perfect sinless son of God, the one who is able to die on a cross and give up his life for us because he was sinless. But the point I want us to understand is that he was in fact tempted in every way, just like us. And what that helps us to understand, first of all, is the perfectness of our savior. But the other thing that helps us with in a practical way is that temptation in itself is not sin. Think about that for a moment. Temptation in itself is not sin, but it is giving into the temptation that leads us to sinful thoughts and to uh, actions. Now, Jesus was perfectly able to withstand the temptation. And what I love so much about this little glimpse into his life pre-ministry What I love so much about it is that Jesus gives us a template to follow when we, in fact, are faced with temptation. Because man, there's temptation everywhere, isn't there? I don't know. I sometimes I'm just like, I wish I could get away from temptation. Don't you ever wish that? And yet then it's just, it's in your face all the time. There's constant temptation all around us. And we know that. 
Um, but what do we do when we're faced with temptation? Well, I want to take you to one example that was given to us in Matthew chapter four. So this is one of the instances where Jesus was being tempted by the devil. Notice what it says. It says, again, the devil taketh him up to an exceeding high mountain and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. So he brings them up and he says, look at all of these kingdoms. Look at how amazing they are. And he said to him, all these things will I give thee if you'll fall down and worship me. So here's the temptation. He says to Jesus, if you'll just worship me, think about it, Jesus, the son of God, worshiping Satan. He says, if you'll just worship me, I will give you this world. And I love what Jesus says to him, get thee hence Satan. And that's a nice way of saying, get out of here. <laughs> get, get out of here, man, get out of my face. <laughs> Look what he says, for it is written. You see that? For it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shall thou serve. You say, what is he talking about here? This is only one of the three examples. But here's what's so great. In each of those situations, in each temptation, Jesus responded in the exact same way. Every single time he says, it is written. What's he doing? He's declaring the truth of scripture over the temptation. So here's what he's saying. He's giving us a pattern to follow. And, and I want you to really understand this today. He's giving us a pattern to follow. And he's saying, when you are faced with temptation, you need to go to the authority of the word of God for help with that temptation. And this is really, really important because we have the word that is given to us today, don't we? And it has authority over our lives. It has authority over the temptations that we face. And what he's saying here is you need to go to the word of God to help you to fight against, help you to see where there is an error in giving into temptation. And you need to stay with it. And you need to turn to the word of God to help resist and fight against temptation. You say, well, where does it say that in scripture? Well, in Psalm 119, verse number one, or verse number 11, it says, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. This is a huge gospel truth right here. If you hide the word of God in you, if you memorize the word, you have it in your heart, it is something that will help you resist and battle and fight against temptation. It will. If you don't believe me, try it. <laughs> try memorizing scripture. And this here is such a great principle for us to know that scripture, the word is what will help us with temptation because you and I face a lot of temptation. I thought of it this way. Now you might think this is kind of cheesy, but I want you to notice in the reference there, the last three numbers. What do you see there? 911, right? I, I even see it the other way. I see it in reverse. 911, 911. Okay, so who do we call in an emergency? 911. What do we do in a temptation emergency? Well, 119, 11. Yeah, but yeah, you got it. You got it. Think about that. 911. What am I going to do? I'm faced with temptation. I don't know what to do. I need to resist. I want to resist. I don't want to give in the temptation. Think about this verse. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Uh, I'll tell you a personal story. When I was, uh, when my wife and I, before we got married, uh, way back in the olden days, um, we were apart for about eight months. So from May until uh, December, we were apart. And so I was I was living uh, at, in the U.S. at a church that I was about to serve in and she was living at home. And so we had eight months. And so uh, one of the things that I did not want to do is I did not want to give in temptation when I was apart from my future wife. I didn't want to ruin what I was headed towards. You know what I'm saying? I didn't want to bring extra baggage with me. And so uh, she'll remember this, but I, I printed up Bible verses and I put them all over my apartment. <laughs> I had an apartment all to myself and, and uh, above the TV and above the wall, on the wall, I had different verses all around there to help me with areas of temptation so that I could remain faithful to my wife-to-be who was to come. I don't tell you that to, to make me look good or anything, but the point I wanna get is that there's power in scripture. And there were times where maybe I was tempted to watch something I shouldn't watch. And right above the TV, there was a verse printed out there. And I would say that like, oh, Okay, don't give in to that temptation. You need to find the areas that you struggle with in temptation and you need to go to the word of God and you need to get that word in your heart. It will help you so much. And that's the pattern that Jesus gives to us that he had authority over the enemy and he did so by using the word of God. So he gives us this example and he reveals his authority over the enemy Satan. But if you'll notice 
uh, not very much longer after his private victory in the wilderness, he then publicly reveals his authority over the enemy as well. Look with me at verse 21. I'm going to read several verses here. And they went into, uh, went into Capernaum and straightway on the Sabbath day, he entered into the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his doctrine for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. In verse 23, something happens. Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit and he cried out saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Verse 25, and Jesus rebuked him saying, hold thy peace and come out of him. Then when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed, verse 27, as much as they questioned among themselves saying, what thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commanded he, even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. And immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. Okay, I don't have the time today to do justice of this story, but imagine that as Jesus went to the synagogue later on, there was somebody in the place of worship who had an unclean spirit, a demonic spirit within them. Jesus uh, confronted them after he, well, the demon confronted Jesus. He said, what are you doing here? <laughs> Get out of here. By the way, that means he was comfortable there before. Isn't that interesting? He was comfortable there before. And when Jesus showed up, he wasn't comfortable any longer. And he came to him and he said, hey, what are you doing here? Jesus then spoke to him. And this man that was possessed with the demon, the demon came out of him. But yet as he came out of him, he spoke affirming again the power of God over the evil forces of Satan. And Jesus just simply spoke and, and the power of God was uh, over that man and the demon came out of him. Ironically, the people that were there, they didn't really even acknowledge or even hear what he said. They didn't even figure out. They were asking the question like, who is this guy? How does he have authority? When yet the, the, the unclean spirit said, we know you're the Holy One of God. Jesus had the authority of God over the enemy. You say, well, what does this mean for us? Well, it just is a reminder that he still does have power over the enemy. He still does. God has power over the wickedness and the sinfulness of this world, but also the power of Satan over us. He has the power. He has authority. And as believers today, we need to rest in his power. We need to rest in his authority. We need to remember that God is greater than our enemy. So often when you look at our world and you look at all of the terrible things, it, it seems sometimes like Satan is getting the victory. And he does get the victory in some ways, certainly. But Jesus is king, number one. And he is the one who's ultimately gonna get the victory because he has authority. He has authority. And you can claim that power and that authority into your life as well. Here's one of the great things though. And I, I, I hate to come back to it again. Actually, I don't. The word of God has authority. And the word of God has power. And so remember, when it seems like Satan's getting the victory, God has the answer for us. He has the answer for us. And so we can turn to him and we can turn to his word and we remember that we have authority through his word. So there was authority over the enemy that we see. Secondly, we see in the life of Jesus, there was authority in his preaching. Authority in his preaching. Look again at verse 14 to 15. It says, now after that, John was put in prison Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And here's what he said. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. The first thing Mark mentions here is that John the Baptist had been placed in prison by King Herod. And so it seems like wisdom would dictate that Jesus would move his ministry to the region around the Sea of Galilee. Notice there it says Galilee, that whole area uh, there was considered to the, the region of Galilee. And so as he goes to this region now, he relocates and he begins to preach a gospel and his gospel is the gospel of the kingdom of God and a message like John the Baptist of repentance and faith in the gospel. Now understand, this is not the first time that Jesus had preached. Uh, John's gospel tells us uh, about how in his ministry, there was a time where Jesus and John the Baptist had a parallel ministry for a while. So this is some months, maybe even a year later that this takes place, this thing that is uh, given to us here in the gospel of Mark. But now that John was arrested, uh, Jesus then becomes the primary preacher and notice he preaches a gospel of the kingdom of God. Now, last Wednesday, I'm just going to give it a nice plug, but last Wednesday night at 7.30, when we have our midweek Bible study, Levi uh, taught an amazing lesson on 
the, on the kingdom of God, what that is and what it looks like. It was incredible. And I would encourage you, come on out for our Wednesday night services. Uh, you would, he, get, he was able to take 45 minutes and give us a full understanding of what that means based off of the Lord's prayer in, uh, in uh, Matthew chapter six. But the kingdom of God is something that needs to be understood here because Jesus came and he preached about a kingdom that was about to happen. Now to the Jews that were listening, there was certainly a connotation or to them, they would have understood it in a physical type of a way. Remember they're under occupation of Rome. And so for them, the idea of a kingdom of God was about defeating Rome and being free from that and, and, and being completely uh, um, at free and, and being the most powerful kingdom again. So for them, there was certainly a political revolution uh, read into that phrase, but Jesus was not speaking about a physical kingdom. We know that. He was speaking about a spiritual kingdom. He was speaking about his reign over the hearts of his people and that the only way to that kingdom is through being born again into the family of God as John chapter three teaches us so well. And so he comes here and he talks about there's this kingdom that is coming and the message that he is preaching is a powerful message. If you look back again at verse 21 and verse 22, it says, when he went then to Capernaum, so that's up in the Northern side. So he went up there and it says on the Sabbath day, he entered in the synagogue and he taught and notice again, they were astonished at his doctrine. Why? For he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. As he moved north to that town there of Capernaum, I have it up here on the screen, which interestingly enough, uh, when we were there last year, uh, everyone local calls it Capernaum, which I was just totally blown away by that because my whole life I've heard Capernaum. Uh, but Capernaum, I'll say Capernaum because we're used to that right now. Uh, but he went up into that northern side and it says that he went up there and he began to preach then in the synagogue. This is, uh, this is uh, the Capernaum synagogue right here. Now, obviously there's some elements of Greek, uh, Greek architecture in there, but this is the, the place and there's still some of the original uh, original synagogue that was there during the time of Christ. And of course it's been built upon over the years. Just across the street from there is where they believe Peter's house was. And so Peter was uh, from Capernaum. His whole family was there. Uh, his home was there. Jesus made this his home base for quite a while. It was a major city along a, a major trade route. And so there would have been a lot of people coming in and coming out and Jesus was there and he began to preach in this synagogue. And this is where he preached the message of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom of God. Uh, Matthew relates uh, with us the reaction that Jesus received here in uh, Matthew chapter uh, seven. Uh, I don't have the verse here for us on the screen, but in Matthew chapter seven, it talks about how Jesus at another time taught and he had a lot of authority and people were astounded by, they were, I mean, they were shaken by the fact that he had such authority. And so Jesus came and he preached this doctrine and he had authority. You say, well, why did they view him as different from the scribes? Do you notice that? It says not as the scribes in the verse there. Well, because for the Jews, the scribes that would teach them and would uh, talk to them, they spoke from an authority in the sense that they had the authority of the law and of course the oral traditions and oral law. They were educated people. So they did have some uh, appeal, of course, as they spoke, but Jesus was different because he didn't speak from authority. He was authority. He spoke as the word. Think about it. It is the word preaching the word. Imagine that. <laughs> and that's why it was different. As well, it was different because he spoke to the common people. He spoke to what they were going through. He challenged them. He used illustrations from all around them. And most importantly, he was filled with the spirit of God. And so he spoke to the heart. He spoke to the conscience. He spoke to the will of those that were listening. And to them, they said, man, I can't even believe what I'm hearing right now. Who is this guy? How is it he's talking like this? Later on in John chapter seven, his enemy said, no man ever spake like this man. Because Jesus with the authority of God, the father behind him and the fullness of the spirit was preaching with such authority that no one had ever heard it before. How, how in, in, just incredible that is to think that Jesus came and he spoke with authority and it's because what he was speaking was the word of God. Later on in Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, he said this uh, about the word. He says, for this cause also thank we God without ceasing because when you receive the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, notice, but as it is in truth, the word of God with effectively works also in you that believe. Understand that today we hold in our hands or in our phones or in our iPads, we hold the word of God. 
and it has authority. And it's because it is from Jesus himself. It is the power of God and it's given to us today. And so we have authority and it has relevance in our day-to-day lives. And so Jesus exemplified or illustrated his authority through his preaching. But there's one last thought that I have for us this morning. And I know you're getting hungry. I can see it in your eyes. (laughs) There's one more authority that we see in our passage. And that was there was authority over his followers. Okay, now we're entering into a whole new stage of ministry with Jesus. Authority over his followers. Look with me at verse number 16. Now, as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, come ye after me and I will make you to become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. Verse 19 says, and when he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee and John, his brother, who also were in the ship mending their nets. And straightway he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and notice went after him. As Jesus made his way down from Nazareth, as he came down to those seaside towns there in Galilee, it would have been a very familiar journey for the Lord. It was probably a journey that he had walked many, maybe even hundreds of times in his 30 years of life at this point. But this time was different. This time, uh, it was a, a chance for him to begin to build his team. Things were happening. He was about to build a team, these disciples that would eventually be described as the ones, if you remember how they were described as the ones who would turn the world upside down for the gospel. And so now here we see Jesus as he is walking along and he sees some men. First, uh, uh, we notice he saw Simon, Peter and Andrew, then later on, James and John. Now, this is the first time that they're mentioned here in the gospel of Mark, but it is the the first time that Jesus had come in contact with them, actually. If you remember back to other aspects of the gospel, Andrew was actually the one who came to Jesus first and brought Peter, Simon, that's Peter, later Peter, brought him with him. And so Jesus already had a relationship, at least a brief relationship with these men. They knew what he was about. James and John as well uh, had spent some time with him and they also knew, of course, who he was. They had heard uh, him speak. They would have recognized him as a rabbi with authority. And so there was a bit of familiarity when this happened. I think sometimes people have this idea that it's just total strangers, you know, like, hey, bro, come on, let's go. You know, like, no, that wouldn't work out. (laughs) There were people that knew him, they knew about him, and I believe had already begun to believe in him. But here we see Jesus come along and he shows up at their place of work and he calls them to a new career. He calls them to a new purpose, to be fishers of men. Jesus, did you know this? Jesus did not invent the term fishers of men. Sometimes we give him that. We say, oh man, Jesus came up with that. No, he actually didn't invent that term. In fact, it was a term that they would have been very familiar with. It was a term that was often used by people who were intellectuals or teachers, and they used it uh, to basically what they say, we want to capture the minds of men. We want to capture them so that they will come and follow me and after their teaching. The idea is that they would bait the hook with their teachings and then they would catch disciples. So for Jesus to say, come with me and I'll make you fishers of men was actually not a strange thing to them. It wouldn't have been like, they wouldn't have been like, whoa, I've never heard of this before. This would have been something that would have been familiar, but of course, at the same time, had a totally different meaning, didn't it? A completely different meaning. In fact, in that day, it was an honor if a rabbi or a teacher said to you, come and follow me. It meant that you were worthy to be taught. You were worthy to be trained. And so Jesus, as he calls to these men, he says, I want you to come and follow me. They would have understood the calling, but the expression of that calling would have been completely unique and completely different than they would have ever expected. Notice they were fishermen. They were fishermen. What we understand from this passage is that more than likely they were self-employed. It's also believed that James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were probably pretty wealthy. And one of the reasons we understand that is because when they leave, notice it says that they left their father with the hired servants, meaning they had the ability to hire other people to, uh, to do their job. Later on, there's also the implication that maybe uh, Peter and Andrew and James and John, that they actually had a business together or at least cooperated together in this uh, business of fishing. 
but it really didn't matter what their background or ability was. Jesus saw something else in them. I love how it says in verse number 16, notice, as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw them. He saw them. Later on, he saw John and James. What was it that Jesus saw in them? What was it that Jesus saw in them? I, I was meditating on that this week. What was it that Jesus saw in these men? Because to everybody else and to you and me, they're just fishermen, right? They're just guys who are trying to make a living and they work hard. And I'm sure there are some tough guys. They spent nights out on the ocean and or out on the lake there. We, we know that. But what did Jesus see in them? I wrote down a few thoughts. I wonder if when Jesus saw Peter and he saw him casting his net out there as we read about, that he saw a man full of passion, but a man full of failure. I wonder if Jesus saw the 3,000 souls that would be saved during that single sermon that, date, uh, that Peter would deliver on the day of Pentecost. I wonder if when he looked at him and he saw in his sovereignty and he knew his omniscience that uh, one day Peter would be the one uh, leading Gentiles to be added to the church. As he looked at him, did he see that he was a man willing to die a martyr's death, the one who would be faithful to the very end? And yes, he saw Andrew as well. Andrew, of course, was the first to follow Christ. And in his own very quiet way, Andrew had a great impact for the gospel. Each time we meet Andrew in the gospels, he is bringing somebody to Jesus. Think about that. Every single instance of him, he is bringing someone to the Lord. He was considered to be the first evangelist. He took the gospel to the regions around the Black Sea, places like current day Russia and Ukraine. Finally, he died a martyr's death in Greece, being crucified on a cross in the shape of an X and upside down. I wonder as Jesus, as he looked at John, he saw the one who had walked by his side as part of the inner circle of the disciples. He saw the one who he would one day entrust the care of his own mother from the cross. Of course, I know Jesus would have seen the future author of the book of Revelation and the other letters, the one who was exiled for his faith to the island of Patmos. He saw James, another one who was in the inner circle one of the only three that would experience the raising of Jairus' daughter, the transfiguration and Christ's agony there in the garden of Gethsemane. James was the very first apostle who was martyred for his faith when he was killed by King Herod in AD 44. I wonder if that's what Jesus saw when he looked at them. And I wonder this morning, what does Jesus see in you? What does Jesus see in you? Because in every one of his children, there is a hope. There is a future. There is a potential for God's glory to be revealed in our lives. I wonder today what faithful act of service is in your future. Which person led to Christ? What uh, country reached with the gospel? What church planted? What missions project funded? Which child raised for the Lord? Uh, what, great what great gift of sacrifice is in your future that God is going to use. Now, we don't know, we don't know at all. And in fact, uh, those men did not know what was in their future when Jesus called them. They had no idea. And you and I don't know what our future is as we follow Jesus Christ. But I gotta tell you that Jesus is still calling us to follow him. He's still calling people. He's saying, come after me, follow me, learn of me, read of me, follow me. The question is, how are you going to respond? How are you gonna respond? See, each of these men that are described for us here reached a point where they accepted Christ's authority and power and calling in their life. And so there was no hesitation, was there? There was no questioning. I love how Zebedee responded when his two sons said, hey, dad, we're out. We're gonna follow this guy. Nothing. I would have to imagine that he encouraged them to go. That's a great message for Father's Day, isn't it? <laughs> If God calls your children, encourage them in that. Don't discourage them. Don't say, hey, maybe you should get a career first before you follow Jesus because there's no money in being a pastor. <laughs> encourage them. Say, hey, if, if that's God's will for your life, I'm behind you all the way. In fact, I'll support you in that. They responded by accepting his authority over their life. And because they accepted his authority, they then went on to do incredible, great things for the Lord and bringing glory to him. They didn't know what the future would hold, but it didn't matter, they still followed. You know, that same call is given to us today. 
In Luke chapter nine, Jesus said this, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me, follow me. The call to us this morning is to simply follow after Jesus, to recognize his authority in your life and to say, God, whatever it is that you want me to do, I'm willing to do it. I'm willing to do it. And that brings me to sort of our big question of today. Have you submitted your life to the calling and the authority of Jesus Christ? You know, so often people say to me, pastor, I wanna be used of God. (laughs) Pastor, would you pray with me? I want God to use me. And they'll even tell me the things that they believe God is going to use them to do. And they'll say, hey, I think God wants me to do this and God wants me to do this and God wants me to do this. But then as the pattern of days and months and years go by, It doesn't happen. And most often it's because they're simply, they might say with their lips, they wanna follow him, but they're not truly following him with their heart and with their life and with their actions. And so the the challenge for us today is, would you be willing to submit your life to the Lord today? Jesus is revealing to us his authority. And part of that is he's calling us to surrender ourselves to his authority in our lives to surrender ourselves to his calling, to seriously and genuinely say, God, what do you want to use my life for? Have you ever done that? Have you ever reached a point in your life? Maybe it's at a summer camp. That's a great place for that to happen, right? Maybe you were a teenager or a young person at camp and God really spoke to your heart and you said, God, I surrender to you. Maybe you need to remember that surrender today. You might be that some of you to say, you know what? I've never, I, I'm saved today. I'm saved. I've trusted Christ as my savior, but I've never surrendered to him. What that means is I've never placed my life at his feet and said, God, use me in whatever way you want to use me. God, I'll go wherever you want me to go. I'll serve how, whoever you want me to serve. Whatever it is, God, I, I will do it. And from a heart of passion and of love for your savior, you said, God, I surrender all to you. I surrender all to you. If you've never done that, That's what I wanna challenge you with today. And here's what's so great about it. You're not surrendering yourself to some scary future. You're surrendering yourself to the savior, the one who loves you and died for you and gave himself for you. And and he has good things for you. And this is the call of the passage here. Place ourselves under the authority of Jesus Christ. Have you recognized and submitted yourself to his authority? I recognize there might be somebody here this morning who you've never placed yourself under the authority of his saving power. And you've never trusted him as your Lord and savior. Can I encourage you to do that today, to make that decision today? But if you are a Christian, and I know the majority of you here this morning are Christians, would you simply submit yourself and just say, God, whatever you want to do with my life, doesn't matter how old you are, doesn't matter what you're, what you're locked into, doesn't matter how many kids you've got, how, how much money you have or how little money you have, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The question is, is will you follow Jesus? Will you surrender your life to him? And that can be radically transforming into your life. That doesn't mean that he's going to make you a missionary somewhere. That's always our fear, right? If I surrender, I'm going to the mission field. <laughs> he might do that. Would it be a terrible thing if God called two or three or four or five or 10 people from this church to go and be missionaries around the world? That'd be amazing. That'd be fulfilling the great commission from Vancouver. And we we should pray for that, but it's gonna take someone to be surrendered first of all. and say, God, I give you my life. I surrender to you. And let's be like these four men. When Jesus said, hey, come and follow me. They said, I'm all in. Let's go, right? (laughs) I'm with you, God. I'm with you.